it's clear that uh, Dr. Frey and I disagree um, of what the science says. Um, 2010, Nature Biotechnology looked at 168 different studies on yield. 124 of them showed an increased yield in biotech crops. Uh, in the developing world, which I mentioned has adopted this, this technology, uh, it feels between 16 and 30 percent yield increases, and in some crops, 85 percent yield increases because it dealt specifically with a very intractable problem in uh, those countries. Um, he mentions glyphosate being a toxic, nasty compound, but he also said that acutely it's not toxic. 2012 study in regulatory toxicology and pharmacology said our review found no consistent patterns of positive association indicating a causal relationship between total cancers or any single type of cancer and glyphosate. That's the global opinion. Another study in 2012 in the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health, same conclusion. No causal link between glyphosate and any cancer. He mentioned that there's no testing. Well, he barely gets in in that being true. The governments don't do much of the testing themselves, but what they do do is dictate every single test that must be done. The companies that want to regulate, have their, their product commercialized, what's known as deregulation, must do an enormous battery of different tests in order to satisfy government regulators. All of those tests are dictated by the government. The number of tests, the number of controls, the number of replications, all of that is decided by international toxicology standards. The companies have zero say. Just in the case of food testing, there's two categories of molecular analysis, five categories categories of comparative analysis, five categories of toxicology, three categories of allergenicity testing, and GM crops are the only crops in the world tested for allergenicity before commercialization, and two ca categories of nutritional analysis. That's just one small segment of the testing that must be done on every single GM crop before it's allowed to be commercialized. Statements that they are not tested by the government is a dodge. Governments don't test any more than the government tests to whether your car is safe. The manufacturer must supply the data that the government requests for every product before it's allowed to be commercialized. And GM crops are no different in that respect. And the last point I'd like to make here is about organic certification. Organic certification is not based on the end product. It is based on using a prescribed series of techniques to grow the crop. And that's why, as Joel said, there has never been a case of organic decertification due to tra trace amounts of GM pollen getting into their crop. That was very clearly made evident last year when the Organic Seed Growers and Trade Association sued Monsanto. When they went to court, the judge asked for the evidence. 30,000 plaintiffs. Not one person could bring any evidence forward. The case was thrown out. Are we done? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I will repeat what I said. No genetically engineered crops have been tested by the regulatory agencies in the USA and in Canada, ever. <coughs> That's very clear. I also want to <coughs> look at a statement that I often hear, that millions of people have eaten trillions of meals containing GE ingredients over the last 15 years, 17 years, and nobody has ever fallen ill. And you know, it is true, I have never seen anybody fall when they go out of the restaurant. But I've never heard such a, I've never heard a more empty statement. Where is the follow-up? Where is the studies? Where, how do we know? There is absolutely, this is a completely, the most unscientific statement I've ever heard. And the biotech companies and Mr. Wager definitely pride themselves in being very scientific. <coughs> what I see is Correlation studies 
and the curves have been put together, the studies have been put together by a doctor in Seattle. She got very interested into this aspect uh, of public health, and she asked for the, the CDC, the um, Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, for the statistics. And she has plotted the number of a whole, about 20 of them, different degenerative diseases that have become epidemic in the last 15 years. And they all start in the mid-1990s, and she plots the numbers of cases of kidney injury and liver damage and autism and obesity and celiac and Crohn's disease and leaky gut and all those things. <coughs> she plots those against the use of glyphosate in corn and soy. This is for the USA. We do not do this kind of things in Canada. And all the curves start basically at a baseline starting in the mid-1990s and they just go up. And these are correlation studies. They are not studies, they are not scientific studies. I find them extremely alarming and many of people in the medical system find them also extremely alarming and I think we should investigate them very, very quickly. Thank you. I think I'd just like to reiterate uh, that independent testing of genetically modified organisms, much less this apple, simply haven't been done. And, and transgenic organisms, including this transgenic apple, really isn't substantially equivalent. The Arctic apple is not an apple. It is, it is something distinctly different. It alarms me, actually, that 17 seeds out of 40,000 were contaminated. That is just the beginning of, of the destruction of the malice genome, just with short, uh, a short period of testing. 17 leads to exponential contamination. That's the way it works. The fact of the matter is, the beast of regardless whether it was a slight majority, a, a, a big majority, doesn't make any difference. BC Fruit Growers opposes this technology. It opposes the, the establishment of Arctic Apple. The U.S. Apple Association opposes the establishment of Arctic Apple orchards. The Hort Council opposes it. Apple farmers across North America oppose this apple. It is uh, a fact that organic growers must have uh, uh, organic rootstock. Uh, many rootstocks are seedling, and, uh, and, and if, if uh, organic uh, Arctic apple genes contaminated even seed stock, much less the uh, mother plant tissue, which is what we, they don't contaminate the apple that we eat, but if, if, if the seeds contain this genome, then they can't be used as rootstock for organic production. So, so uh, uh, I, I, I too want kids to eat more apples, but I want them to eat real apples. And quite frankly, I think apples are pretty well packaged the way they are. The challenge of uh, the 21st century is, is to figure out how to bring forth a food system that uh, is less technologically intensive, uh, requires less resource and packaging and processing. And, uh, and the apple is something that is packaged pretty doggone well, well enough for us to have eaten them and grown them for thousands and thousands of years, and I think that it's good enough for us to continue eating as is for another few thousand years. So that was the skill test. Now we go on to the fun and games. Um, I propose to open forum to the floor. I have one specific request. There are several of us on the podium who have legitimate hearing challenges. So would you please, when you ask your question, be loud, be clear, and if it's to a specific individual, if you identify the individual, that would be perfect. If it's a general one, I'll try and orchestrate some, some alchemy among the group. And I will try and um, take the question and ensure that the panelists have heard it. Joanne and others are on the floor to take your questions, so the 
it's open, open mic. So if you could please stand up and say your name. Yeah, hi, uh, Ken Barton, and um, with the recent uh, announcement that Canada has um, signed a preliminary agreement uh, for free trade with the EU, um, and I'm fairly familiar with some of the stuff that uh, in the EU, because I have two brothers that were in farming over there, I thought, well, from my knowledge of Canada, my brother's knowledge of farming in the EU, how prepared is Canada for this? How is our regulatory processes? So I started doing a bunch of digging around. And, and I, I appreciate the input uh, that all four of you have given. I'm still as confused as ever, and I tell you, I have got a pile of research here that goes from Scientific American to the EU legislation, um, to one here that in particular I'd like to put to you, and if I may, I'd just like to read this, uh, this part. You can find this in gen Genetically Modified Foods Harmful or Helpful. And it, you'll find it on www.csa.com. It's Discovery Guides. <coughs> and the article is, uh, the, the paragraph is, How are GM foods regulated? And what is the government's role in this process? This is in the, uh, written in the USA. There's a paucity of stuff on, uh, written in Canada. And I've even got some of the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency's comments on it, and that's not encouraging. It says here, in the United States, the regulatory <coughs> process is confused because there are three different government agencies that have jurisdiction over GM foods. To put it very simply, the Environmental Protection Agency evaluates GM plants for environmental safety. The U.S. Department of Agriculture evaluates whether the plant is safe to grow. And the, general, uh, the FDA uh, evaluates whether the plant is safe to eat. The EPA is responsible for regulating substances such as pesticides or toxins that may cause harm to the environment. GM foods such as the BT pesticide laced corn. The EPA, uh, then they look at the nutritional value. That, um, uh, the USDA is responsible for GM crops that do not fall under the umbrella of the EPA, such as drought-tolerant or disease-tolerant crops, crops grown for animal feeds, can whole you, fruits. Can you, can you put this in the form of a question, because it's <coughs> beginning okay. to get too long. Okay, give me a second. The FDA, because, and I mentioned this because uh, one gentleman there was mentioning the FDA, uh, the FDA, their, their stance is that uh, GMO, uh, they just look after, it's a, a substantially equivalent to unmodified natural foods and therefore is not subject to FDA regulations. So my question comes back to about the fact that we were saying that um, it's been, that uh, these crops have been stated as being safe by the uh, FDA, but they say no because GMO doesn't fall under their purview. Yes. Um, again, that's a little bit of a twist of an accurate statement, but doesn't give you the true <coughs> context. The FDA regulates food for safety, but substantial equivalence is not a biotechnology devised system. It was devised by the UNOECD World Health Organization. It's an international standard for uh, food toxicology testing. Now the FDA demands that all those tests must be met in order for them to then declare that it is substantial equivalence. At that point, then the FDA states not that it's safe, but there are no health concerns. There is no evidence to show it's harmful. There's no such thing scientifically as something being 100% safe. They state that there's nothing harmful in this particular product. And they only say that after they have seen the data. Presently, there's 130 GM crops, approximately 130 GM crops that have uh, gone through the US regulatory system. That's EPA, USDA, and FDA. Of those 130, 130 went through the FDA process. Now, it is true that it is still not mandatory 
but I think that will change <coughs> soon. But 100% of the GM crops that have been commercialized in the US did go through that evaluation process. Can I, um, with your permission, you, you raised the issue at the very beginning about the free trade agreement with the European Union. And, and does anybody on the panel understand the implication now that Canada is engaging in a, in a free trade association with the European Union? How does that work if, uh, as I understand it just now, the European Union is opposed to uh, GMO products? Um, will that change as a result of this well, free trade agreement with Canada? Presently, people have an, um, an idea that the US or the European system is completely opposed to GM crops. Well, it, it, it is and it isn't. They, they presently allow the importation of 17 different, actually no, it went up, uh, 19 different GM crops into the US market, or into the European market. Most of those, the vast majority of those crops, are for animal feed. So we already have close to 20 GM crops that are already allowed to be uh, imported into the European system. There's a backlog in their, in their system of 45 or 50. Um, and their system is broken as to how to allow um, deregulation, if you like. Um, and they admit that. Um, so the ones that have already been allowed to be imported will continue to be allowed to be imported. Those that have not passed through their uh, regulatory system will probably be held up, uh, for the time being anyways. Um, Europe is becoming a bit fractured now because the European High Court struck down the bans as being illegal. They struck it down, actually, because they had no evidence of harm to humans or the environment that they recognized. So the European High Court said the ban is illegal, but individual countries in Europe are still pressing forward with that ban, and the EU as a general um, political organization really doesn't know which way it's going with this particular issue. Okay, thank you. We have a young gentleman there. Um, I'll get back to you. You're in a minute. Young gentleman standing up there with the microphone. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name's Jeff. I'm a local oh, filmmaker. Louder, Jeff, yes. Sorry, my name's uh, Jeff. I'm a local filmmaker here in Kona. Okay. Um, my question um, is for the whole panel. Um, if uh, money didn't exist, I know it's a hard thought, but if money didn't exist, um, would GMO and would these companies exist? Um, you know, if nature's so good, a lot of scientists agree that uh, nature's pretty smart, most of the time smarter than humans, I think. Um, so, yeah, I guess the root, the root question is kind of a few questions, but the root question, would money exist, or would money, if money didn't exist, would GMO, and uh, why are we changing nature so much? Okay, um, I'm going to ask the panel to, to each give a, a brief answer, beginning, Ken, if we we'll, we'll go around this way. The answer is no. <laughs> if money didn't exist, if this, if money, financial gain, profitability, money were not, and uh, was not an issue, would GMOs be brought into effect? If money was not in the equation whatsoever, would we have GMOs? Is that is that a fair? I think my presentation was pretty clear that it is about, it's the bottom line, of course. Okay, that's a Gallic no. <laughs> um, people have an idea that agriculture is natural. There's nothing natural about agriculture. We have been manipulating the DNA of our food for 10,000 years. That's why it's not wild anymore. GM crops are just the latest version. What would happen without money is we would see a great many more of the publicly funded GM crops that are presently sitting on the shelf. And we're talking thousands of them that are sitting on the shelf that would be in the public domain, but nobody can afford the massive cost of the deregulation process, the testing process that every GM crop has to go through. We're talking 10 to 20 to upwards of $100 million in some case in order to get a GM crop through the testing procedures. The publicly funded ones can't afford that, so they sit on the shelf. That's a shame. Okay, so 
Yeah, so um, <clears throat> to echo that briefly, I mean, every banana you eat is a clone of another banana. Every banana you eat is the exact same. Uh, all apples are propagated by grafting now, even tractors and everything else. It's all technology made to more efficiently make more quality, safer food for cheaper. And GMO is part of that solution, so I would say definitely yes, it would be, would be around without money. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry, I've got one here, then you, and then one. And you need a microphone. I'll go over to this side. Does that make sense for the Okay, yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Ron Kristenak, and I'm retired uh, from agriculture and agriculture Canada. I worked on the trade issue. Uh, on the GM area, there are certain uh, industries that have decided not to go, not to, uh, or have lobbied for their no, be no GM crops, including the potato industry and the wheat industry, primarily because of the concern about uh, trade and uh, the loss of trade, particularly to Europe, but also some of the other countries that, that have this sort of GM products. I know there has been, there is some export of apples from Canada, um, particularly to UK, for example. Um, I haven't looked at trade data lately, so I don't know what the change is. But anyway, um, have you examined the concern about trade uh, for the industry and particularly what the implications would be of losing those exports uh, to Europe and some of the other countries? Um, I know it's not going to be a problem with the United States because they would presumably approve this product. And, uh, uh, there would be some coordination of approving the product in, in the North American market. So anyway, that's my question about the trade implications. Yeah, so that has been an issue that's uh, been looked at uh, by ourselves and also by the U.S. regulatory agencies. And so one of the things that apples have an advantage over uh, many other crops is that they're segregated by variety right from the time that they're picked. So every arctic apple, as soon as it's picked, is going to be kept segregated from every other apple variety, just like, you know, when you pick a gala, it gets the store and it's a gala, it's not, we don't know what apple this is. So that makes it uh, very easy to regulate in terms of uh, international trade for areas that wouldn't accept a biotech crop. Um, the U.S. assessment actually said that approving uh, arctic apples would be a benefit for the U.S. Uh, and likewise would be the case for Canada, because the countries that would allow the importation of arctic apples would have that the U.S. and Canada would have that benefit of being the only country